This is section 9.6, Evaluating Trigonometric Functions. All right, so um, as we saw last time, we have a plane, the xy plane, and we're going to have angles drawn in standard position. Um, so the, the uh, initial side is on the positive x-axis and the terminal side is somewhere. I'm going to draw uh, just a random angle in the first quadrant um, and I'm going to pick a point on that ray that's on the, the terminal side of the angle, just some random point and that will have coordinates x, y. Then if I drop a segment from that point down to the x-axis, perpendicular to the x-axis, of course, then this length is x, as we saw before. This is y. And we're calling the hypotenuse of that triangle r. And uh, if our angle is indeed this one right here, which we will probably call theta, then relative to that angle, the three sides of the triangle have particular names that we assign to them. Um, the, the side of the triangle opposite the angle, which is right now labeled Y, is called the opposite side. Um, of course, you know that the angle, the right angle across from it, the side across from the right angle is the hypotenuse. And the other angle that helps, I'm sorry, the other side of the triangle that helps form the angle theta, the one that's a leg of the triangle, here labeled x, is what we call the adjacent side. Okay, and this may start to sound a bit familiar uh, from your... Um, geometry experience in high school. Um, if we have an angle, which in this one they decided to call it A, which is fine, I'll, I'll switch to that. Instead of calling it angle theta, they're calling it angle A. And um, they're saying that we want to let A be an acute angle. In this right triangle. In standard position. Which means we're basically sticking with first quadrant right now. Um, right, so there is a definition of each of the um, right triangle based definitions of the trigonometric functions. So this will not contradict what we've already talked about, but we're just saying here that if angle A is an acute angle in standard position, then the sine of A is going to be opposite over hypotenuse, which of course does not contradict what we said earlier because the opposite here is y and hypotenuse is r. So that's really the same idea. We're just going to use the sides of the triangle by name as well as the definition that we've come up with. Um, 
Let's see. Cosine will be adjacent over hypotenuse. Which is x over r. And tangent is opposite over adjacent. And in fact, for these first three, you may know a little mnemonic that helps you remember this. You may have, may have heard of so ka toa, which is a mnemonic for helping you remember that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. Uh, so that's of help. Now, um, one of the things you have to be careful about is if we have a random triangle and it's not in standard position, so I just kind of rotated this about, um, if this is angle A right here, and this still is a, a right triangle, then this is now opposite, which is an X or Y or even the hypotenuse um, from our earlier drawing. This is adjacent, not X or Y or anything, and this is hypotenuse, not X or Y or R. So if the triangle isn't in standard position, these definitions actually are a lot more helpful and in fact, probably one of the most confusing ones to deal with is if it looks like this. And you're thinking, oh, that's in standard position. It looks like the one above. But they call this angle A. This will be opposite. And in that case, X would be opposite, which is really going to mess with you. So if A is in standard position, you can use the um, X and Y and R definition, which we will use quite a bit. But if a, angle A is not in its standard position, you really want to know the definitions in terms of the words opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. So that's very useful to know. Okay, so cosecant of A, therefore, is hypotenuse over opposite, which, since this is in standard position, it's also R over Y. Uh, secant of A is hypotenuse over adjacent. And with this angle in standard position, it also happens to be R over X. And the cotangent of A is adjacent over opposite. And in the standard position, it also is x over y. OK, so in standard position, these two uh, definitions of the trig functions actually agree quite well. And so make sure that you know both the right triangle uh, definition, that's in terms of words like opposite, hypotenuse, and adjacent, and the, um, the definition of the trig functions that we talked about earlier, which would be in terms of x's and y's and r's. Okay, so make sure that you've got that distinction down. Okay, so um, we've got an example to look at. We've got a triangle. Well, I didn't draw, draw it very well. Um, hopefully your picture of it is better than this. Of course, as long as you know what I meant, I suppose it will work. And they give us, this is side... Um, the side length is 7, this one is 24, and this one is 25. That's what we're told. Okay, so we're supposed to find sine of A, cosine of A, and tangent of A. So, being very careful here. We're not in standard position. That A is there at the top of the triangle. Um, so don't be fooled, it is still going to be for this right triangle opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is 7, hypotenuse is 25. The cosine of A 
will be adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is 24. Hypotenuse is 25. And then tangent of A is opposite over adjacent. So that's going to be 7 over 24. Notice you weren't asked in this problem for all six. There'll be times when you're asked for maybe half of them, maybe all six, maybe just one or two of them. So um, please don't waste time doing all six when you're asked for fewer than that. Especially on a test, you won't have time to, to waste on doing extra work that's not requested. Okay, so let's um, look at some triangles that you know from earlier courses. Uh, this one is called equilateral and what that means is that all three sides are the same and that implies that all three angles are the same measure and the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 if they're all three the same 180 divided by 3 is 60 so 60 degrees is the measure of each of these um, angles and in a moment I'll tell you why I'm doing this, but I want the side length to be 2. All three sides I want them to be length 2. Then what I want to do is I want to draw a line from the vertex at the top down to the opposite side in a perpendicular fashion, um, which creates 2 triangles and I'm probably only going to label one of them because they are the same they're congruent and so even though they may not look congruent in my bad drawing um, labeling one of them is like labeling the other so I'll just spend time with one of them okay so this is two still um, and what we've done with the angle at the top is cut it exactly in half. We've bisected that angle, which means that this angle is now 30 degrees. The other 30 is in the other triangle over to the right. This is still a 60 degree angle. And the base has been split into half. We've bisected the base there. And so this base part is 1 as is the other base uh, and the other triangle to the right. Now the question is, what is this third side? What is the length of that? And I'm labeling it x not because it's vertical or horizontal, it's just an unknown. Uh, so that we're going to call that unknown. Let's see if we can figure that out. Um, so uh, because it's a right triangle, we know the Pythagorean theorem applies. So leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So x squared is equal to 4 minus 1, which is 3. And so x is the square root of 3. You may notice that I did not put in plus or minus because the context of this particular problem is it's the length of a side and that has to be a positive number. So I did not on, on, on purpose, I intentionally left out the negative possibility for x because it's a length. And so what we've created is something called a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Oh, sorry, that looked pretty bad, so let me try again. Um, and of course, it, like I said earlier in this course, the... Um, triangles that I'm drawing and the angles I'm drawing are not perfect. So by labeling them, I'm saying this is what I intended. If you took something and measured the actual angles, I'm sure they're not exactly 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Okay, but it's, a, it's called a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And it's one of the special triangles that you're accountable for. And it occurs in a lot of different instances in this course. Oh, that's an A. Usually I can spell except when I'm talking. Um, so it's one that you're going to need to know everything about. So let's talk our way through this. Uh, the information's already over there to the left, but I want to talk my way through it so you understand it 
and the importance of each one of these things. Across from the 30 degree angle is the shortest side, which is length one. And that's why I made that first triangle have a length of two, so that the shortest side of this triangle I was creating would be one unit, okay? The hypotenuse is two, and we just figured out that the other leg is square root of three. And so this ratio of one to two to square root of three is always the ratio of the short leg to the hypotenuse to the long leg in a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, okay? So take that as a given and we'll go with that idea. That's one of our two special triangles that we're going to encounter right now. The other one is an isosceles right triangle. If you'll recall, isosceles means that two of the sides are the same. So even though it may not look like it, I'm going to call this side length one. Oops, one be that. I'll do that in green. Um, this one's one. The shortest side is one, and this one is the same length, so it's also one. Now, in having drawn this, um, perhaps you can tell me what those two angles are. What are their measures? Well, if the sum of all of them is 180 and 90 is tied up in the right angle, that means that you're left with the other 90 degrees. And if those two sides are the same, the angles opposite them have to be congruent. So 90 degrees that we had left divided by two makes these each 45 degrees. And this is what we call a 45, 45, oops, no, I can make that into a 5. 45, 45, 90, right triangle. And the ratio of the sides is 1 to 1. That's leg to leg to hypotenuse. We haven't figured that out yet. So I'm going to go over here where I have a little bit of extra space. I'm going to just carve out some space right here. And if the hypotenuse is unknown x, then leg squared plus leg squared is hypotenuse, which I might think of as x squared. So the sum of those two numbers is 2. And so x is since it's a length, square root of two, not negative, square root of two. So this is square root of two, and this ratio one to one to square root of two is something you're gonna need to know. So this information over here on the right, which I'm gonna encircle, is information you're responsible for. You need to memorize these pieces of information about these two special triangles. So that's worthy of your attention for sure. All right. So let's find some trigonometric values of these special angles. So if you look at the right triangles, we actually have three special angles, a 30 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, and a 45 degree angle. And I want to find the sine, well, all six trigonometric functions of all uh, three of those. So I want to start with 30 degrees. And look at the triangle. I'm going to use the opposite. Notice I didn't label except for that X that was the uh, altitude of the 60, 60, 60, or the equilateral triangle. Um, that was X, but it wasn't the X that we usually are thinking about. Uh, that's None of that's labeled, and 30 degrees isn't in standard position anyway, so I'm going to use the opposite hypotenuse and adjacent definitions for this. So um, sine of 30 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of 30 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent of 30 degrees is opposite over adjacent 
which rationalizes to be square root of 3 over 3. Cosecant of 30 degrees is, uh, well, we can think of this as two ways. We can think of it as hypotenuse over opposite, or we can also use the reciprocal identities we learned earlier. And to me, that seems easier uh, than having to memorize the other three, the cosecant, secant, and cotangent versions of things involving opposite hypotenuse. And unless you are doing those in isolation, um, I would use reciprocals. And so 2 over 1 is 2. Um, the secant of 30 degrees is the reciprocal of the cosine answer, so 2 over the square root of 3. And after rationalizing, that becomes 2 squared, so 3 over 3. And then the cotangent of 30 degrees. I'm actually not going to take the reciprocal of the final answer. I'm going to take the reciprocal of the first answer I got. And the reciprocal there would be square root of 3 over 1, or more simply just square root of 3. Okay, let's do the same thing for 60 degrees. I'd like for you to do is to pause the recording and see if you can do the 60 degree answers all by yourself and then come back and see what I got. So go ahead and pause it now and come back when you're done. Okay, so um, sign. Make sure you're looking at the 60 degree angle and so now um, adjacent and opposite have kind of switched from what we were thinking of for 30 degrees. So make sure you've got your head on straight about this. Um, opposite is square root of 3 over hypotenuse 2. For cosine, adjacent is 1 over hypotenuse 2. And tangent is uh, opposite square root of 3 over adjacent 1. So that's square root of 3. So the cosecant of 60 degrees is 2 over the square root of 3. And if you look over at our work on the left, that's going to simplify to be 2 square root of 3 over 3. Uh, something you need to realize really quickly is there are only a limited number of answers. And um, for the six trig functions of 30 degrees and 60 degrees. And so you're going to see a lot of repetition in uh, looking at these two lists. So uh, don't be surprised if I don't necessarily go through this uh, simplification process twice because I just did it for secant of 30 degrees. Okay, so anyway, uh, secant of 60 degrees will be the reciprocal of 1 half, which is 2. And the cotangent of 60 degrees is the reciprocal of tangent of 60 degrees. 1 over square root of 3 is what that would be. And after rationalizing, you get square root of 3 over 3. OK, so um, well, I really wanted to be able to do the 45 degree answers without rolling away from, well, maybe I can do it this way. Oops, that went too far. Um, let me see if I can move it just a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll squeeze it in over here to the right and, and we'll be okay. Okay, so, oops, sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. All right, so now we'll do the 45 degree answers. Do you want to see if you can do these by yourself? Pause the recording and see if you can get these uh, 45 degree and trigonometric answers on your own. And then come back and see how you did. OK, so um, looking at either a 45 degree angle, because it doesn't matter, um, the opposite is 1 and the adjacent is 1, either way. And the hypotenuse is square root of 2. So here we go. Um, opposite 1 over hypotenuse square root of 2. Then rationalize, you get square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 45 degrees, 
adjacent is 1 over hypotenuse square root of 2, which is also square root of 2 over 2. And then the tangent of 45 degrees is opposite 1 over adjacent 1, which is 1. Okay, the cosecant of 45 degrees is the reciprocal of the sine. I'm going to look at the first thing I wrote there, and square root of 2 over 1 would be square root of 2. Secant of 45 degrees is also square root of 2 for the same reason. And the cotangent of 45 degrees is the reciprocal of 1, which is 1. All right, so uh, that finishes up the, well, I'll leave it over there for a second if you're still looking at it. Um, that finishes up the tr six trigonometric values of all of the angles in our two special triangles. Okay, so I think that's worth paying attention to. Now, one thing we could have done is um, we could have looked at these angles in radians instead of degrees. And I'm using degrees first because I'm trying to start from a basis of what you already know. But for example, had I asked you to find the sine of pi over 6, which is the same angle as 30 degrees, I would get the same answer. And so um, for pi over 6, the six trigonometric values are the same as they are for when it's an angle, because it's the same sized angle, just using a different unit of measure. So uh, replace every 30 degrees above with pi over 6, and you get all the same answers. And I've done one example over there, sine of pi over 6. Over here, take every 60 degrees out and replace it with the radian measure, which is pi over 3 and you get the same th six answers. And take out 45 degrees and put pi over four in its place and you get the same set of answers. So um, I'm not gonna write all six times three, 18 of those with radians in them. Just realize that had I written say pi over three instead of 60 degrees, I would have gotten that the secant of pi over three is the same as the secant of 60 degrees, which is 2, as an example. All right, so um, that's a whole bunch of information, and you're responsible for knowing all of those. What I would say is knowing all of those might mean that you draw what I've boxed there in pink, and you already have, hopefully by now, memorized the um, Sokotoa and the reciprocal relations, and you can figure these out as needed using that information. So it's not like I really want you to memorize those values that I just posted on there, but you should know them and be pretty fast at getting all of them, whichever one you happen to need, and whether it's in degrees or radians. Um, if it's 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or 60 degrees, which would be the same thing as saying if it's pi over 6, pi over 3, or pi over 4, you should be able to find any of the six trigonometric functions of those three special angles relatively rapidly. And after you've done this for a little while, you will memorize some of them because you use them a lot. And anything you see a lot of, you probably commit to memory without even having to try very hard. So I'll say you need to memorize these, but that's not really what I mean. I mean, you need to know how to develop them and get them like we just did. Um, and of course, you're only doing like one of them at a time. It's usually not all six for a lot of questions. So if I just randomly say, I need for you to find the secant of 45 degrees, you're just focusing on that one. You draw the 45, 45, 90 right triangle. Remember the ratio of one, one square to two. And remember, how to get secant, which is, you know, hypotenuse over adjacent. And then you're just going to have to simplify your answer and you're done. So that's kind of the mode of operation I'd like for us to work under is that um, even though I, I kind of might say memorize these, I really want you to be able to draw a picture of uh, the correct right triangle and then figure out using adjacent hypotenuse and opposite. Okay. 
So, um, now, what I'd like to do now is um, remind you of a convention that's used when naming the sides and angles of a triangle. Wow, that is not a very good triangle. Oh well. Okay, well, let's assume we have a right triangle. Uh, it is conventional to call the right angle C and the two angles, um, the other two, it doesn't really matter. Usually one of them is labeled B and the third one A. So usually C is reserved for the right angle. It doesn't have to be the right angle, but a lot of times that's what we use. Now, if those are the angles, the sides opposite them have the same name, but lowercase. So capital letters for the angles of a triangle, lowercase letters for the sides. So opposite the um, right angle, C, will be the hypotenuse, little c. And uh, across from angle A is side A. And across from angle B is side B. Okay? So I'd like for you to do a couple problems with me. And so that means I really kind of want you to pause um, and, and find these out on your own. Find sine of A and find cosine of B. So pause the recording, figure those two out, and come back when you have them. Okay, sine of A is opposite A over hypotenuse C. Okay, cosine of B is adjacent A over hypotenuse C. See, the A and B will switch depending on which angle you're talking about. Uh, one of them is opposite, one of them is adjacent. And so you need to kind of get that clear in your head. Oh, look at that. Look at that. They have the same answer, the same A over C. So that implies that the sine of one of my acute angles is equal to the cosine of the other one. Well, that's kind of interesting. Okay, well, if that worked, um, let me see if something else would work. Find the tangent of A, then find the cotangent of B, and come back when you finish that, and we'll look at it. Okay, the tangent of A is opposite A over adjacent B. The cotangent of B is, <coughs> excuse me, the cotangent of B is adjacent A over opposite B. Hey, wait a minute, those are the same thing. So the implication is that the tangent of one of the acute angles in a triangle is the same thing as the cotangent of the other angle. And when I say these are uh, A and B are one angle of the triangle and B is the other one, what do those two angles add up to, A and B, no matter how big A is? Won't A plus B have to be 90? If the sum of all three angles is 180 and C is taking up 90 of those, we're left with 90. That means A and B have to add up to 90 degrees. And so let me make a little note here is that A and B are called what? What's the vocabulary word for they add up to 90 degrees? Right, they're complementary. They're complements. They're complements. They add up to 90 degrees. Okay, well, we're on a roll, so let's just kind of keep going. I'd like for you to find the secant of A and the cosecant of B. Okay, so pause the recording, find both of those. Okay, the secant of A is hypotenuse C over adjacent B. And the cosecant of B is hypotenuse over opposite B. Oh, those are the same. That means that the secant of an angle is the same measure as the cosecant of its complement. 
and I finally said it the way I wanted to say it. Um, sine and cosine are called cofunctions. Tangent and cotangent are called cofunctions. Secant and cosecant are called cofunctions. And so, as it turns out, um, the if you know the trig function of an angle, it's always equal to its co-function of the complement. Okay? And um, so if I knew that cotangent of B was 5, then that means that the tangent of A has to be 5 as well, if A and B are complements. So that's kind of a, an interesting fact that we can draw from these definitions that we've come up with. All right. So how could I write B in another way if they're complements? Well, uh, if I want to stick with A, then B, if they're complements, could be found by taking the 90 degrees and subtracting A, right? Do you agree with that statement? And so what that implies then is that the sine of A is equal to the cosine of its complement and the complement of A is 90 degrees minus A. Right? And the cosine of A will be its cofunction sine of the complementary angle, 90 degrees minus A. And the tangent of an angle is its cofunction cotangent of the complement of A, 90 degrees minus A. And the cosecant of A is its cofunction secant of the complement of A, which is 90 degrees minus A. So what would secant of A be? It will be equal to its cofunction, cosecant, of the complement of A, 90 degrees minus A. And then, of course, cotangent of A, its cofunction is tangent of the complement, 90 degrees minus A. Okay. Um, and these collectively are known as, and I didn't leave myself room, um, these are called the cofunction identities. I should have left room above uh, to write this title above them. So this title should actually be right over here someplace. Those are the cofunction identities. Um, and as it turns out, uh, because 90 degrees is the same thing as pi over 2, they're the same size angle in different units of measure, I could replace every 90 degrees in that set of identities with pi over 2, and it would be true that way as well. So, for example, um, the tangent of an angle would be equal to the cofunction, cotangent, of the complement of A, which if we're in radians will be pi over 2 minus A. Pi over 2 is the complement. Pi over 2 minus A is the complement of A. So over here I could write pi over 2 minus A is also the same thing as B. Okay, so uh, those six identities could be written with pi over 2 replacing 90 degrees in each case. Now, um, 
even though we did this for uh, A, which is an acute angle, uh, these identities hold true. The cofunction identities hold true for all angles. I'm not going to prove that to you. I'm just going to state it. These identities hold true for all angles. Well, for which um, I always have to give you this little caveat. Um, when I say all, if it makes you divide by zero for some reason, then no. <laughs> it wouldn't hold for that angle. But as long as we're in the domain of the function, uh, these identities would hold true for any angle. It could be a 743 degree angle. It could be a 42 pi over 73 angle. And these statements would be true. So, um, the directions for this example are write each expression in terms of its cofunction. In terms of its cofunction. So, if you're given, say, cosine of 52 degrees, 16 minutes, that's going to be equal to the cofunction of cosine is sine. And since we're in degrees, it's uh, co, I'm sorry, it's complement will be 90 degrees minus the measure of that angle. And if you recall what we did for subtraction is I'm going to borrow one degree from the 90, making that 60 minutes. And I'm going to subtract 52 degrees, 16 minutes from that, which leaves me with 37 degrees, 44 minutes. And so this is equal to the sine of 37 degrees, 44 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to write down B and I want you to see if you can do this one by yourself. Rewrite tangent of pi over 6 in terms of its cofunction. So pause the recording and come back and see how you did. All right, let's see how you did. Um, what's the cofunction for tangent? It's cotangent. And what angle or what um, unit of measure are we using for our angles in this problem? It's radians. So the complement is found by taking pi over 2, the right angle, minus the angle we're given. So let's see. Pi over 2 is the same thing as 3 pi over 6. So that'll be 3 pi minus 1 pi is 2 pi over 6. Well, let me write this out in a couple of steps. Um, 3 pi over 6. You know how to get common denominators, right? And 3 minus 1 is 2, so that's 2 pi over 6, which of course reduces to pi over 3. Okay, and let's do another one. Secant of 1 degree. No, I'm sorry, that's just secant of 1. There's no degree symbol there. Be careful, that's secant of 1. So in terms of its cofunction, the cofunction of secant is cosecant. And 1 does not have a degree symbol on it, so we're in radians, and the right angle in radians is pi over 2 minus 1. And that's as simple as we can really make that one. Uh, so we'll leave that one right there. Okay. Now, a very important concept in doing trigonometric values of angles um, particularly when we have special angles, like the 30, 45, or 60 degree angles, which is the pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3 angles, is 
the idea of a reference triangle. Okay, so to get at what a reference triangle is, we have to first understand what a reference angle is. So we'll start with reference angle and work our way towards reference triangle. Okay, so if I have um, a terminal side in the second quadrant someplace, and if I drop the uh, from some point on that terminal side a point on that down to the x-axis, then the acute angle the acute angle between the terminal side of the angle and the x-axis, never ever the y-axis, it's always between the terminal side and the x-axis is your reference angle. So this is your reference angle. Okay, It's between the terminal side and the x-axis. So um, let's draw one that ends in the third quadrant. Say that and take a point on that ray, the terminal side ray, and draw a segment from there to the x-axis at a perpendicular angle. And then the acute angle that's between the terminal side and the x-axis is that angle right there. Um, by the way, the notation we're going to use for reference angle is going to be theta prime. If theta is the angle, if this is theta, then that angle is its reference angle theta prime. So uh, before we do, do the third uh, um, quadrant and then the fourth and then the first last, um, Let's make up an example and see if we can figure out what the reference angle is. Let's say, for example, that theta is 150 degrees. Well, to find theta prime, the reference angle, you might realize that going from positive x-axis all the way around to the negative x-axis is the straight angle. That's 180. And we're having to back up some from 180 to get to back to 150. How far do we have to go to get from 180 to 150? Well, that's a 30 degree change of angle from the negative x-axis to the terminal side of this. And so in this particular quadrant, it turns out that you can do always do this using 180 degrees minus whatever theta is. Now, you can memorize that as a formula. Um, I tend to take everyone individually and think geometrically what's going on. I'm usually going to some special uh, angle that I know, like the straight angle here was 180, and then I think about backing up how much to get back to 150. That's kind of my thought process. Um, I'm not saying you have to use that thought process, you can use the formula if you want, but I'm just telling you what I do. Maybe that'll help you. So if this is theta here in the third quadrant, um, theta prime is that marked angle right there. And let's make, make up one. Let's say that theta is uh, 225 degrees. Well, when I'm graphing that, I realize that I start at the positive x-axis. I go around to the negative x-axis. So I've gone 180, and I'm thinking, how much more do, do I need to move from 180 to get to 225? And that is 45 degrees. Again, that may not be the way you think about it, and that's fine. Um, 
let's see, there is a formula for that. I never do these formulas, so um, I have to think about it. Um, this formula is theta minus 180 degrees. Is that one. Uh, and like I said, I don't use these formulas, so if you do, you'll have to memorize them and don't rely on me to, to be able to spout them to you um, because that's not the way I think. But if you can do it with the formulas and get the right answer, more power to you. Okay, so let's get, find a fourth quadrant terminal side. Uh, let's do this one. Pick a point on the uh, terminal ray, draw a segment to the x-axis in a perpendicular fashion. Um, the reference angle is the angle between the terminal side and the x-axis. So that angle right there inside the triangle is our reference angle. Oh, you might, I said that just now and that's actually kind of important to realize is that the reference angle is always an angle that's inside of the right triangle that you're drawing. Okay. And by the way, uh, I just stumbled upon the next idea we would talk about is reference triangle. It's the triangle we've been drawing. It, the reference triangle contains the reference angle and is a right triangle. And you draw it by um, taking any point on the terminal side and drawing a segment from that point to the x-axis and that creates your reference triangle. And if the reference angle theta prime happens to be 30 degrees or 45 degrees or 60 degrees, you can actually find out the six trigonometric values of that angle very easily. Oops, that's not the, I'm trying to be color coded here and that was not the right color. Okay, so the angle theta goes like this. And let's make up one. If theta is 290 degrees. What is theta prime? Well, I've almost gone all the way around, which would be 360 degrees. So how much more do I need to go to go from 290 to 360? Well, another 10 will take me to 300 plus 60. That's going to be 70 degrees. Okay. Now, is there a formula for that? Yes. You could find that in the fourth quadrant by taking 360 degrees and subtracting theta. Do you see why I'm hesitant to memorize three more things when I can just kind of figure it out logically and, and geometrically and using my number sense. Uh, that's why I do it that way, but if you need to memorize them to get the right answers, by all means, uh, do that if that's what you have to do. Uh, you'll just have more to memorize perhaps than someone else. Okay, and the last one um, is in a lot of ways the easiest one is a first quadrant angle. Let's say it's this one and we draw the reference triangle by taking any point on that terminal side and drawing a segment to the x-axis at a right angle. Um, the reference angle is between the terminal side of the angle and the x-axis. And there's theta prime. And because it's in the first quadrant, the angle here is theta. So the formula for this is theta prime is always the same thing as theta. So uh, if we had, let's say, a 50 degree angle, then that would, um, a reference angle, that would mean that the angle is 50 degrees. They're always the same. Okay, so um, that's how we'll, we'll draw reference angles and reference triangles. So, to practice that a bit, um, we're asked to find the reference angle for each of these angles. And by the way, my formulas that I gave you, um, if you're in radians, instead of 180 degrees, that'll be pi. 
and instead of 360 degrees that'll be 2 pi. So if you're relying on the um, formulas make sure that you realize that when it's in radians you have to use radian measures throughout. Okay so if the angle is 218 degrees what is the reference angle? Well my thought process is draw a picture and this may not agree with your thought process and that's fine but I'm gonna have a, a, an angle I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna start moving and when I've drawn that much of it that's 90 I'm not there yet that much of it I'm at 180 and now I'm getting kinda of close so I think well how much further do I have to go I'm at 180 I'd have to go 20 plus 8. I'd have to go another 38 degrees. So I'm going to try to draw something where I think it's about 38 degrees. May not be exactly. That's okay. And what is the reference angle? What is that angle? Well, we just said it. When we were drawing it, we actually mentioned the size that we'd have to go. It's how far we have to go past 180. That's the 38 degrees we mentioned when we were graphing it. So this is why I tend to use pictures and thought process and not rely on formulas because uh, I could very easily get messed up there. Okay, so let's do the next one. If theta is 1387 degrees, well, the reference angle is acute, so that really big angle, um, I'm not going to be able to use my formula for this one anyway, so we need to think this through. What I need to do is I need to find a um, coterminal angle to that one. So I'm going to take this down to an angle between 0 and 360 degrees, the smallest possible positive angle, and that's why we did that practice earlier. And I just so happen to know that if I subtract three full revolutions from that, which you could have done one at a time until you got down to a number between 0 and 360 degrees, and that would have been fine, that you'd get 307 degrees. And 307 degrees is coterminal with our angle. Okay, so if I go to draw this angle, um, it's actually sufficient to draw the coterminal one because that's, you know, we're just finding the reference angle. So let's see, going around, this is 90, 180, 270. Um, I'm almost to 360. How much more do I have to add to 307 to get to 360? Well, that's 53 degrees. So I'm going to start all the way around and back up 53 degrees, which is about that much. And so what is this reference angle? I just said it, right? If you're graphing this and thinking about how to graph it, um, you're probably going to end up stumbling upon and maybe even saying the size of that acute angle that's between the terminal side and the x-axis. Okay. Um, now if you were going to actually draw that angle, realize you'd have to go all the way around three times. So let me draw that off to the side here a little bit. If you wanted to draw the angle, that angle I drew is not it. It is one, two, three times around, then go another 307 and stop right there. Uh, you see why I didn't want to draw that because it's really hard to see all those loops and recognize where um, you label theta prime would be right there. Uh, that's technically the one I did in green is technically correct but using the reference angle gave us the, uh, the uh, 307 degree angle, the, the coterminal angle, gave us the correct answer so uh, that's the one I wanted to use. It's easier. Okay, C. 5 pi over 6. Now I can bet that you are not as comfortable with um, drawing these as you might be 
uh, degree measured angles, and I get it. So I'm going to help you through this one a bit. One thing you might want to memorize or just know pretty soon is like 90 degrees is pi over 2. Um, 180 degrees is pi. 270 degrees is 3 pi over 2. And 360 degrees is 2 pi. And of course, if you don't move from the initial side, that's also an um, angle zero coterminal with 2 pi. So if you know those, you're in a better place. So 5 pi over 6, that's the same thing as 5 sixths times pi. So it's 5 sixths of pi, which means it's smaller than pi. And if you were to break pi into six equal pieces, so see if you can envision what that would look like, you're going to use five of them to get to 5 pi over 6, which is about right there. Okay, That's 5 pi over 6. Well, how much are you short of being all the way to pi? Well, pi is, in terms of sixths of pi, 6 pi over 6, right? So how much shy are you? That's the reference angle. And how big is it? It's 1 pi over 6 short of being 6 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6 needs another pi over 6 to become 6 pi over 6, or pi. Okay. So um, that will take practice, and you will get better. Uh, the ones that involve radians, you're going to have to uh, do a lot of get a common denominator kind of processes in order to do that correctly. Okay. All right, so now that we've talked about how to find a reference angle, um, let's turn to and, and put that together with things we've already talked about, the trigonometric functions, and let's put this together and see how we can f use this information. Um, the question here is to find the values of the trigonometric functions for 210 degrees. Okay, so write that down. And to start this, um, I would graph a picture of 210 degrees. So in standard position, the initial side will be a, always at the x, positive x-axis. And then to graph the 210 degrees, from here I've gone 90, now I've gone 180. How much further do I have to go from 180 to 210? Well, it's another 30 degrees. And that will have my terminal side right there. And the reference angle is 30 degrees, as I mentioned as we were graphing it. So if we look at the triangle that we get, if we take any point on that terminal side of the ray, uh, of the angle, and draw a line segment from that point to the x-axis, we will create our reference triangle. And we know that as far as the lengths are concerned, um, across from the 30 degree angle is the shortest side, so length 1. Um, that means the hypotenuse is 2. So we memorize this, 1, 2, square root of 3, right? And the leg, the longer leg, is square root of 3. So now assigning values to that, look at where the point is, right here, on that ray. In that particular quadrant, quadrant 3, what kind of number is x? It's negative. So we're going to take the length, square root of 3, but because it's moving to the left from the origin, we're going to say that our x value is actually negative 3. So we get the length from the uh, special triangle, 30, 60, 90, right triangle, or 45, 45, 90, right triangle, and then uh, assign the positive or negative sign to that number um, depending on where that point is. So this 1 for the um, opposite, the 30 degree angle short side, um, 
that's below the x-axis. So that means that the y value for that is negative 1. And as we said, r, the hypotenuse, will always be positive. So r is 2. So now that we have those values, and I'm going to write them again over here for clarity, but you need not. Um, as far as I'm concerned, labeling the picture over there was sufficient. But this is just so you can look at it and, and see it with a lot of clarity, what each of those values is, because I know I wrote kind of small over there. So the sine of 210 degrees. Remember, that was our original problem. And we're using the reference angle, 30 degrees, to get the lengths of the sides of the right triangle that we create, the reference triangle. But we're using the location of that point, because of the 210 degrees, to assign negative values to both x and y, because we're in the third quadrant. Okay, so the sine of 200, 210 degrees is y over r, so negative 1 half, cosine of 210 degrees is x, negative square root of 3, over 2. So notice we're back to the definition with x, y, and r here. Okay, tangent of 210 degrees. Tangent of something is y over x. So that's going to be negative 1 over negative square root of 3, which becomes positive square root of 3 over 3. The cosecant of 210 degrees is the reciprocal of sine of 210 degrees. Negative 1 over 2's reciprocal is 2 over negative 1, which is negative 2. Uh, the secant of 210 degrees, the reciprocal of cosine, will be 2 over negative square root of 3, which rationalizes to be negative 2 square roots of 3 over 3. Then finally, cotangent of 210 degrees is the reciprocal of tangent. And the reciprocal of 1 over square root of 3, the negatives have canceled in my mind, is square root of 3. OK, and there you go. That's what we use the reference triangles for, for which we need to know the reference angles. And that completes that example. So if it's a non-quadrantal angle, remember quadrantal is the terminal side ends on an axis. If it's anything but that, then um, we're going to find our least positive angle that's coterminal to the given angle. Um, and then after we found that, find the reference angle theta prime. We're going to find the trigonometric function values for the reference angle theta prime by determining the correct signs of those values depending on whether x in that quadrant is positive or negative and depending on whether y in that quadrant is positive or negative. And of course r will always be positive here in the tr world of trigonometry. All right, so let's do an... Oops. Uh, we've run out of space there, so I'm going to end this recording and move on to another one.